Hello, hello. My name is Jean-Louis Vincent, and uh, I have the pleasure to try to explain how to do a fluid challenge. Many people speak about fluid challenges, and they do not do it right. Let, let me start by reminding us that we need first to have a clinical problem before we give fluids, before we think about giving fluids, of course, in large amounts over a short period of time. Could we go by formula? No, that's ridiculous. To randomize patients for a restricted fluid administration or liberal fluid administration, of course, restrictive fluid administration can be bad as liberal fluid administration can be bad. Remember this study here, a pilot study in patients with septic shock, 100 patients, six <laughs> had to be moved away from the restrictive fluid strategy to a more reasonable fluid strategy. We cannot put all the patients in the same basket. Fortune, misery, these are relative terms. Fluid balance, I already gave three liters. No, presence of edema, no. Patients may have edema and be hypovolemic. There may be alterations in permeability, low albumin levels. Edema does not mean that the patient does not need perhaps some fluids. If you have a leak in your gas tank, you will st still put some gasoline in your car right? So, edema does not exclude hypovolemia. Let's be careful about the word fluid overload. There is fluid overload. What do you mean? Is it edema or is it high filling pressures in the venous system? So, this is very important. I sometimes use the word fluid overload, but then I say, oh, 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 oh. Let's think about what we really need to say. So we need individualized treatment. So we need proper treatment. Initially in the salvage phase, okay, let's give fluids quickly. But when we are in the optimization phase, we need to individualize our therapies. One patient is not the other. And as we know, there is no single variable. People say, oh, the central venous pressure doesn't say anything. But that's true for any variable, of course. So you may perhaps use artificial intelligence, combining variables, maybe we'll get there. But at the present time, this is not so reliable. We will make progress in the field, but today at the bedside, we need to use a dynamic approach. Let's go quickly over this. If the patient is on fully controlled mechanical ventilation, sedated, paralyzed, we could look at pulse pressure variation or stroke volume variation, but we must be careful this is only during mechanical ventilation with deep sedation anesthesia. It works well in the operating room. It usually doesn't work in the ICU, where we try to minimize sedation. Otherwise, it can tell us in the paralyzed patient or the strongly sedated patient, it can tell us that the patient is still on the ascending limb of the Frank Starling relationship. Let's look at respiratory variations of the vena cava diameter. Doesn't work very well. If it's the inferior vena cava, you can see this meta-analysis. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work, depending on the study. Even if you go through the superior vena cava with transesophageal echo, in sedated, paralyzed patients, it doesn't work so well. So that's how 
we often need to use a fluid challenge technique. And uh, it has been used for many, many years. In 1832, you could see that patients with cholera could wake up and become alert with fluid administration. And then when the fluid administration is stopped, the patient is again somewhat comatose. Very nice description of the fluid challenge. Point is that we need to give a fluid bolus over a limited amount of time. There is no room for just increasing the amount of fluids over half an hour or one hour or two hours. It is not fluid loading. We use fluid challenge when we are not sure that the patient will benefit from fluid. We use it when we do not know whether the patient will respond to fluids or not. Okay? And the aim is to increase galactic output, to increase oxygen delivery to the tissues, and we want to minimize the amount of edema, which could be associated with the increase in cardiac filling pressures. That's the basic physiology. You will not change it. It's the Frank styling relationship. If you look at the heart, you may look at stroke volume. If you look at the circulation at the organs, you may prefer to look at cardiac output. And if you look at preload, you may prefer end diastolic volume. But since the risk is edema formation, you would prefer to look at the cardiac filling pressure. Pressure, a pressure. That's the risk. You want a minor increase in filling, significant increase in cardiac output. And when the patient does not respond, you will have a major increase in filling and no significant increase in cardiac output. That's the basis of the fluid challenge. So what should we monitor? Let's go through these two elements. First, the increase in cardiac output, optimally, that's what we should look at. Does cardiac output increase with the small amount of fluids that I'm giving? If it doesn't increase, stop it. Now, could we have a simple measurement? Maybe tachycardia sometimes. Maybe blood pressure. In trauma, it works. In hypovolemia, it works. But in sepsis, when the vascular tone is decreased, Sometimes one can see a marked increase in cardiac output and yet no significant increase in blood pressure. We showed it a number of years ago. You can see here sometimes a major increase in cardiac output and a very minor increase in blood pressure. So optimally, we should look at cardiac output by the technique we like. It could be a codoppler, although it's not always so easily obtained. But if we do three measurements by the same operator, we could see the effects of 500 milliliters of fluid. So it's not very sensitive. In the operating room, you may even use short periods, one minute one minute of a fluid challenge because things change very quickly in the operating room. You cannot wait for too long. Now, in the ICU, you may actually want to use a relatively short period of time, but not too short. So 10 minutes is usually what we want. We could give 100, 200 cc's in five, 10 minutes. That's what it is. Not more than that. So if it doesn't help, the patient will not receive much fluid. Very importantly, over 10 minutes, we look at what changes in the patient. We do not stimulate the patient. We don't do anything else at the bedside. So we may monitor stroke volume. If it does increase, putting pressures do not increase too much, we continue the fluid challenge. If the stroke volume 
does not increase or if the filling pressures increase too much, we stop. And then we would increase the dose of vasopressors. Perhaps we would use the butamine. So sometimes we have to repeat it, of course. Like in this French study, you know, you may have to repeat the fluid challenges. We all know that. How many patients will respond? It depends on your selection of patients. Optimally, it may be about 50%, but sometimes it's less, sometimes it's more, depending on the, how you use it. Now, finally, we need to realize that the, um, there is a price to pay, which is the increase in filling pressures. If you have a patient with good lung function, you may not even need a fluid challenge if the central venous pressure is low because the risk of edema is low. Whereas if it's severe LES, you may prefer to use the butamine for a blood transfusion. SCVO2 is a very important variable to monitor, but that's another story. Passive leg raising physiologically makes sense, but be careful. Do not look at arterial pressure because Passive leg raising can be a stress for the patient. So look at this paper published already a couple of years ago, but it's excellent. Do not measure blood pressure. You need to look at the transient change in stroke volume. Very important thing. So let me finish saying that if the patient has a problem, if we don't know if the patient will benefit from fluids, then we look at a fluid challenge. Five cc's of fluid is not a fluid challenge. Five cc's of fluid in 30 minutes is not a fluid challenge. 200 cc's in 10 minutes, we're almost there, but we need to monitor the patient's response. So give 200 cc's in 10 minutes and assess the patient's response, preferably with a measure of flow, benefit, and a measure of pressures, the risk. Identify the problem, evaluate the risk-benefit ratio, and monitor the patient's response. These are the three principles of a proper fluid challenge. Keep it in mind. Thank you.